Hi, everyone. I'm very happy that you all came. And apparently, you're excited about the art market like we all are. And actually, it's a historic moment because we have the four key players here on stage discussing on the business models and experience of a market that is still, the online art market is still comparatively small compared to the general global art market, which was estimated in 2013, $65 billion. The online market is, was estimated in 2013 also, 1.57 billion, which is 2.4% of the estimated value of the global market. Um, the online trade report an anticipates that the online art market will rise to 3.76 billion in 2018, which clearly shows the potential for substantial growth. And so I'm very happy to introduce today the main players in the field of online art business, businesses, which is first Adita, Yulka, co-founder of Pedal 8. Then we have Chris Vroom, co-founder and chairman of Art Space. And I'm very happy that Maria Habaybakov also could make it to attend the panel. She sits in the audience. Then we have Carter Cleveland, founder and CEO of Artsy. And we have Susanna Wilson. Forgive me, I think somebody else is still, somebody else's name, Ben Genocchio's name is, is somewhere written here. No, it's not. But he had a flooding in the house. So Susanna Wilson was, she's the director of strategy of Artnet and she was happy to jump in. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so very quickly, I, I run through your bios. Carter is a graduated computer science engineer from Princeton University. He's listed, you're listed in so many power top whatever things that I don't even quote them here or start quoting them. You're very famous for the Genome Project. Um, to bring basically the genome into the online art market. And maybe some of you remember, I did a panel with him in Munich two years ago, and um, there it was the main subject. So I'm really curious to hear what are you thinking about the genome today, what role it plays in your company, and um, yeah, how you balance it versus other components there. Chris received his BA from the University of Chicago and worked for 20 years as final an financial analyst, analyst <laughs> specializing in consumer group and e-commerce equity research spaces, where he was managing director and global group head in the SCSFB technology group. So Adita, next to me, is a trained scientist and Harvard business, business school Baker scholar and has a history of successful startups. You were all over the place, no? In industries from healthcare to technology to art. And last is Susanna, who has studied art history in Harvard University, and she joined Artnest last year. Forgive me the short bio, but I'm excited about that you studied history of art because the rest of you guys are all tech guys or come from different worlds, whereas Susanna is like me, um, did you did your PhD in history of arts. Quickly to your mission statements, they sound all kind of vaguely familiar, I must say. You all want to make art accessible for all people with an internet connection. You want to transform the way that people collect, to create a place for art interested people who buy and sell art, to learn about art and to discover the best of art. Finally, you all want to be the market leader or the vertical killer in this field co concerning traction and sales. So now, quickly to the components, and then we go into media res uh, for the, for the uh, discussion. The, all your companies consist of different components that sometimes overlap, but sometimes stand alone. So there are, there's the auction component, the gallery component. Within this field, there are different ways of, of generating revenues directly or through trans, um, how you say, you take, you take a cut on deals, you do as an intermediary, or you do direct clicks. Then there is, you do themed and curated auctions and um, charity auctions. They can be online or they can physically take place and you, can, you have the possibility to, to interactively bid even if you're not at the auction. Then you have magazines and art tickers, a la Bloomberg. And then you have research component, art price, result databases, and statistics on the art market and artist performances. And then you have the genome, that's Carter. And then you have inven inventory management systems for galleries, archiving, bookkeeping, and shipping. And last, you have what I found very exciting recently to, to discover art fair previews before fairs open, which gives you buying advantages. So far, 
As most of you changed and adapted your business models several times and still do, I thought each of you now best outlines each company's key components and the features working in most successful ways, setting the platform apart in terms of traction and sales, and finally bringing you closer to your aim, being the vertical killer. And I want to start with Aditya, because basically he has changed, you have changed your role model, your mo business model, and your models several times. And yeah, he just... Thank Tell you, Michaela. Thank you for now. that. Yeah, I think sort of uh, it's interesting to note while all of us are trying to bring the art world online and make it accessible to anyone with an internet connection, if you dig one level deeper, each of us has a slightly different business model and are attacking different parts of the market and trying to sort of make sure we can bring it online. So Paddle 8 is an online auction house. We are trying to create the world's biggest auction marketplace consisting of charity auctions with hundreds of museums, foundations, uh, and art foundations globally from LA to Hong Kong, peer-to-peer uh, -peer auctions where we curate the inventory and sort of run themed auctions, and also a third-party marketplace where we're bringing the biggest regional auction houses together to create an auction marketplace so that no matter what you're looking for, you can go to this one destination and find the art or collectible that you're interested in. Um, to your point, Mikita, I think that's a very interesting point. We started as a gallery listing model. We worked with art fairs. We did eight art fairs. We did the Amri show. We had over 400 galleries on the platform. We had hundreds of millions of dollars worth of inventory on the platform. But what we found was that that model wasn't easy to scale from a monetization perspective because sort of there was a big tendency of collectors to go around us and go straight to the gallery. And then secondly, we would literally have to do multiple billions of dollars of transactions to even make enough revenue to justify the capital that we were spending. So we moved away from that to an auction model where we can take a much higher cut on the transaction and control the transaction from start to finish. So that was an interesting pivot that we took, but I think the new model allows us to scale in this industry and control the transaction marketplace and also at the same time have a sustainable business model that evolves over time. Very good. Uh, Chris, then maybe you are very different. You tell us your business model. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, at Artspace, we share the view that a portion of this overall $65 billion in the overall spend in the art market will migrate online. I've spent about 20 years analyzing disruptive, disruptive business models in different industries, and my take is that over time, 10 to 20% of this trade will migrate online in some form. So we think it's a $10 billion opportunity minimum. At Artspace, we have built a curated e-commerce platform. We started with e-commerce and we remain the only 100% transactional site um, out there. We think that that ultimately adds better value both to our partners, um, which is a select group of 300 of the top galleries around the world, museums, cultural institutions, nonprofits, and most importantly, on the customer side, to be able to serve the customer more effectively, we feel like controlling the transaction, particularly at a certain price point, is, uh, is most effective. We do have a concierge service for higher price point sales, which our gallery partners appreciate, um, and we work hand in hand with them to uh, leverage the preference information we're collecting from uh, the visits to the site and from our uh, base of 250,000 collectors to help drive business. Nevertheless, you do auctions, you have a magazine, which is different from Adita's platform. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would say two things. One is that education and information are, are critical. Uh, we're trying to create an on-ramp to engagement, uh, both amongst people familiar with the art world and the larger group of people who are buying art, but we think their experience needs to be upgraded and the type of work they're buying needs to be upgraded and can be easily. Um, but we need a strong editorial platform to facilitate that and so we've invested heavily in editorial and um, you know that's designed to introduce people to great programs, interesting artists, new trends in art, you know, and that's been a very successful way to drive traffic for us. Carter, now to, the, to you and the genome. Um, Sure. Well, I mean, you know, one kind of point I want to start off with is, you know, you talked about the opportunity of, you know, like such a small percentage of the current uh, art market is online and uh, a larger percentage that could be online. I think that um, a lot of art buying today already involves the use of digital images, whether that's emailing JPEGs or, you know, on Artsy, um, we don't facilitate the transaction directly uh, on Artsy for the vast majority of our works. You see it on Artsy and then we connect you with the dealer and then you see it in person. So there's kind of like this interplay between the offline and the online. So I think like the, the, the real opportunity I see is not how much of the existing art market will go online, it's more how much uh, the existing market, um, which currently represents about 3% of 
of households that actually have the income of the average collector, um, you know, how many more of those households um, might become collectors uh, if we removed all the all the barriers to entry um, that, uh, that is currently keeping them out of the market. Uh, art is not an eclectic hobby like buying motorcycles. Um, everyone, every household with disposable income has walls um, and could potentially be uh, be making more conscious choices about what they put on those walls. So that's kind of where I see the like the really big opportunity that obviously plays a little bit into Artsy's strategy, which is broader and like less focused on a particular price point um, or sales mechanism. It's more about there should be one website where you can go and find every work of art that is listed by every gallery, every museum, you know, essentially um, any work of art. And for the vast majority of people and the vast majority of users on Artsy, that is for educational purposes. And we're actually used in universities and colleges all around the world to teach art history for the very simple reason that we have images that you can access for free, which, which can be hard to find in other places. Um, but for a small percentage of our users, um, we are used uh, for collecting. And so the genome and the educational content uh, we create is all part of that larger strategy of we just want Artsy to be the place you go to to find art, and whether that's discovery and learning or ultimately collecting. We think by bringing those two things together, we're paving the way to vastly grow uh, the market. Okay, and how much how much do you think the genome still plays in into real kind of sales? Uh, is not it's, it's basically the information thing more or less. Um, it's it's a, not it's what really you wanted to do, so you changed your model from the beginning, right? Um, a little bit. No, I mean the genome was always a focus from the beginning. The, the genome is essentially you go to any artwork or artist on Artsy, and you can see we call them gene. It's like based on Pandora's model. So a gene can be if you go to Rothko, you'll see abstract expressionism, New York School, color field painting, and so you you understand the art historical context of the artist. But then these genes are also used to make recommendations for other artists and artworks you might like. So it's one of the reasons why we have really high time on site and people um, discover new. We, we hear lots of anecdotal reports of people discovering new artists. How, you know, if we were to delete the genome, would that have a massive impact on sales? Um, in the short term, I don't think it would be a huge impact because a lot of the people who are buying things, who are inquiring with galleries, I think already know what they want, but the genome does help us make better recommendations. It's how we drive recommendations to people, and we've had a lot of success with those. And again, I think, I think in the long term, it is critical to developing people from having a casual interest into one day actually wanting to develop that passion into the things they want to live with and spend money on. Thank you. Now to Susanna. And you have the, ba you're the oldest, actually, online auction house. How old are you with Artnet? Is it t 10 years or longer or? Uh, Artnet <laughs> actually started 25 years ago. So you have a huge advantage actually versus the <laughs> other ones. You should have. It definitely, um, it, has, it has its advantages and it also poses some challenges and uh, presents opportunities as well because we're dealing with, um, you know, platforms the that tech, were built I guess. in the yeah, 80s that, the that we're constantly having to innovate on top of and it, and it definitely keeps us pushing forward. But you have something that we all need is the database. Exactly. So whenever we buy art, I mean, that's my daily bread. I have to go on Artnet. Before I do all your magazines and whatever yeah. else I check, I I'd have love to, to hear this. Yeah, <laughs> I, will, I will check on that. So how far that, that, does that play versus you, you're doing more and more? You want to get stronger into the auctions, I think? Or maybe you tell us a little bit about your strategy. Sure, yeah. I mean, What's when happening? we started 25 years ago, Artnet was really looking to increase the transparency of a notoriously closed off um, industry. So with that as our kind of mission and um, just our lifeblood, we added to it over the years with the gallery network, with auctions, with news now most recently, and all of these things reinforce each other. Like there's a reason that we all have auctions and gallery uh, interactions uh, it's kind of part of the process of buying art and, and loving art. Your new Bloomberg tickers, it's exciting actually. Artner just got a, a Ben Ginocchio from Art and Auctions who really um, cleaned up there. I mean, he, he made visits from 100,000 people to how, how many was it? 1.3 in two years or something. I mean, he was like really developing the business and he just went over to Artnet and um, really wants to be the site now for art news. Mm -hmm. 
which excites me very much. But how, how, how do you see that different from your info tickers? And I get a lot of infos also from you, Carter, now recently on art informations. So how are you just parallel to each other or do you have different niches? I, mean, I think that uh, at Artsy, our, so again, content critical for education. Um, you know, maybe our model when it comes to editorial is we're a little bit more um, like Vogue in the sense that we're, we're going to keep everything positive and supportive. So if there's something that we don't like, we just won't cover it. But if we do cover something, we want it to be always positive, getting people excited about it. So like I wouldn't use Artsy as like your reliable source for, you know, unbiased journalism that's going to uncover corrupt practices in the art world. It's again, it's more celebratory um, and educational focused. Sounds like an equity research analyst, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, at, at our space, the editorial is, is about educating people around artists of interest, supporting gallery programs, showcasing interesting trends in art. But, you know, ultimately, we're a selling platform. And so, you know, I would characterize it with, a, you know, sort of akin to what net porte how net porte has combined editorial and commerce mm -hmm. so success successfully. I think I would second that as well. I think sort of at Parallel 8, we feel that there is a role for tastemakers, particularly interesting tastemakers. Like, for instance, right now we have a sale with Grace Coddington curating a sale of fashion photography that she's really interested in. I think that's because many people, many new people to the art world ask, how do I know what to buy? What is interesting? That this is actually something that is collectible. And I think having those people recommend some pieces and put a collection together is an interesting avenue for people to actually appreciate the art and actually be comfortable with it. So I think, like Chris, I think we use the editorial as a way to support people and educate them as to a transaction, as to what they could sort of particularly be transacting on. Now to another uh, theme is the charity auctions. Basically, you all tap into charity auctions. You all do them, right? Artnet maybe not so much, but all three of you. How is th does this work business, uh, business uh, as a business model revenue-wise? How do you get your cuts and, and how does that work? You want to well, start? I mean, I think that you know, charity auctions for art space are part of a broader strategy of engagement with nonprofits and museums and cultural institutions. So we both sell existing works. In some instances, we sell deaccession works, which is about a five billion dollar business annually. We publish editions and prints and multiples and sell those through places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, the Dallas Art Museum, etc. Um, so to strengthen and deepen the relationship with those institutions, um, it made sense to develop this auction feature, and it's one part of that whole engagement with nonprofits. But for you, it's a big part, no? Yeah, we, we sort of actually, it's interesting, we started doing charity art auctions way back in 2012. So we did the first one in the fall of 2012. We've since done about nearly 300 to date with leading institutions from LACMA MOCA on the West Coast to Asian Art Archives in Beijing, Ulin Center in Beijing, to Sovereign Fund in sort of Hong Kong. We've given away almost $30 million to these foundations through these charity auctions, so it's a big part of their fundraising efforts for the year. And actually sort of have done interesting auctions, like just last week we did the Fabergé auction uh, with the Jeff Koons Act that raised almost $5 million for various causes, including studio schools and the Elephants uh, School. So it is a big part of our platform, but what it does for us is not only do we build great relationships with the community, but it also acts as a great collector acquisition tool for us because each of these 300 institutions has then emailed the entire mailing list to tell them to go bid on Parlade on a particular auction. So our cost of customer acquisition in that sense is negative because these institutions are actually paying us to raise money for them. Yeah, and that's critically important because there's such concentration in this business. You talk to you know, any one of these galleries that are around us in Chelsea and said, what percentage of sale, or how many customers account for 50% of your sales? 15, 20 collectors total. So Padalate's acquisition of collector data and preference information, we collect that as well, I know Artsy does as well, is very important to build that, that relationship. Okay. So then the co I have one question about the competition with Sotheby's and Christie's, Amazon and eBay. Um, because they have a lot of, of brand recognition already and inside intelligence. How do you want to handle that in the future? Is it through the margins? I mean, they have much bigger margins. They take up to a quarter of the, on top of the hammer prices, basically, if you want to sell something. How do you handle that in terms of margins generally for all the hour auctions? Yeah, whoever wants to answer. Susanna, you start first. 
partner. And then also how get you equipped is, is because they um, As an art historian, I think I love to see Artnet and all of our sites as, as special and unique because we sell fine art. Um, whereas uh, the, the competitors you mentioned have a very different subject, I guess you could say. Um, as far as competing with their business models, I think it's, it's something that I think about on a daily basis and I would love to hear other people's thoughts, but I don't have, a, I don't have an answer. I think 50 points on the buy and sell side is a huge umbrella under which companies yeah. that don't have offices on York Avenue and 71st Street are going to be able to build a very nice business with a higher ROI for shareholders. I think I agree with that. I think sort of, though we strongly view ourselves as complementary to Sotheby's and Christie's, I think there is a huge amount of transactions, almost 16 to $17 billion a year, that are below, uh, let's say, $500,000, where Sotheby's and Christie's aren't really as interested, and particularly below the 100000 marks, where in many cases, $100,000 mark, where in many cases, they simply won't take that inventory in. And our goal is to create the ultimate destination for anyone looking to resell a work of art at that price point. And we want to be the one destination where you can do it cheaply, we, we charge one third the commission of these auction houses, frictionless, and sort of remote consignment so you don't even have to move the piece before you sell it. So it makes it very, very easy for people to transact at that price point. And we, we see that what as well on the collector to collector side for the marketplace. There's huge illiquidity in this market in the price point under $100,000. There's $3 trillion in assets locked in that price range that doesn't really have a particularly effective distribution channel. They, they clearly have identified this area now. Therefore, my question, um, how that you will handle that in the future as they go more and more into the online market and will tackle also that field as they see it as a your opportunity. But I mean, that means then to, to be proven who's, who's standing out there. I also ask because the brick and mortar business basically is it more or less a duopoly, maybe three, three companies and how you view that. Now I have, I have here sitting four wonderful companies which I all love, but what sets you apart or what makes you believe in the future that you are the one that will be the one that has this vertical element straight up and be the number one company? Do you mean in the auction business or just generally? As a company. As well, an I mean, I, I think ultimately, I think and, and company. we're all operating in, you know, a very large space where, you know, this channel, which ultimately should be more efficient, has very low share. So, I mean, I think that multiple big companies can emerge. I think ultimately, from art space's standpoint, serving the customer most effectively and developing a customer-centric corporate culture and understanding what those customers want and giving it to them every day is ultimately how we're going to create most value. Aditya, Kata? Um, I think that our, our approach it has obviously been very different. We focused less on creating uh, less on a specific sales mechanism or on creating revenue in the early days and more about creating this listings platform where you can just find all the art or the data. And uh, I think our, you know, one company that I find particularly inspiring, I think is very similar to ours strategically, is LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn just started by getting all this data, structuring it, and putting it online so that the people who are already looking for jobs, looking to hire, be hired, can do it more efficiently. Um, once you have, but you know, you're creating a network there, and once you create that network, um, that network you can build a lot of very valuable businesses on top of it, and uh, it has really um, good defensibility in the long term. So that's like very similar to how we think about um, our strategy uh, for the long term. I agree with that. I think data is an important part of this. Just to put that in context, I mean, Padlet since its inception has now done over $300 million worth of bidding activity. And of that, 140, 130 million comes in the last six months alone. So the idea is there is an enormous amount of data we are generating on every day about people putting in a credit card and placing a bid. 
on a particular piece of art, which then informs what they're interested in and we can use to guide sort of different things they might be interested in in the future. So I think data is an important part of that. The second part of that is what Chris alluded to, that it's $3 trillion worth of locked in inventory that doesn't sell because there's a unique pain point that people can't transact easily and cheaply at the lower end of the art market. That is exactly the problem that we are solving. And if we solve that, we will create a massive sort of uh, market for our company, but also for the art world in general, which expands the art world way beyond the 65 billion you spoke about. So that's the vision of the company, solving that pain point and really creating an easy avenue to people to sell any work of art that they're interested in selling, uh, risk-free and, and with low cost. Susanna, we're almost running out of time and then I open the floor to, for questions. Um, I, I'm not sure I have much to add. I think, I think obviously Artnet is a, is a data company at, in its, at its heart, so that's a, that's a huge part of, of how we plan to build our company and, and build this, this online art market. Okay, so whoever wants to ask questions, I'm happy to take them. We have one more minute, but I hope, I'm hope, I hope just Steffi will be generous and give us some more minutes. Any questions? Then maybe, oh yeah, okay there. Do you want a microphone or how do we do it? Yeah. I mean, I think that the <clears throat> questions about transparency and the impact of the internet on transparency, the internet will make the art market more transparent and there will be people who benefit from that and people who do not benefit from that. I think ultimately in other markets where transparency becomes more the norm rather than the exception, you see spreads widen and volumes increase. So I think it will drive business and, and expand the market and the spreads will decrease as a result of that increased ability to for price discover, discovery, et cetera. I think just to add to that, anecdotally, what we've seen in our charity auction, we've done about 300 of them, is that whenever you bring these auctions online, these charities end up raising about 30% more than they would have raised without the online component when they would have been dependent only on the buyers in the room. So that's just, a, that's just one data point to say how much price appreciation you can get just by exposing this art to a much broader audience of actual buyers and actual bidders. Um, it's not in the gallery model, but at least in the auction model, we are seeing that. Any other questions? Paddle eight. <laughs> no, I, I buy art from a range of, I, I, prior to starting ArtSpace, started a nonprofit organization that's given about $3 million to artists over the, all, all across the country. So I love engaging with artists and going to studios and have lots of artist relationships. I buy from them, I buy from you know, dealers around the world, I buy at art fairs, I've bought work from Paddle eight, you know, bought from ArtSpace more than from Paddle eight. <laughs> what? Oh, for sure, for sure. And uh, you know, ultimately, you know, th our perspective is that you know, we're not supposing that the experience that you ha one has viewing a work of art online is better than the experience of seeing an art, w a piece of art in person, you know, at a gallery, et cetera. So the experiential aspect of art, I think, will always be paramount and preferred. But there are a trillion instances where that's just not possible. Any other questions over there? Sell their work when they can't traditionally through like, nonprofit art centers? 
That's a great question. Um, we had the privilege last year working with an organization called Syria Art, which was raising money for um, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Uh, we raised almost $1.1 million for that organization, of which $800,000 were online bids that we generated from around the world to support this cause. We had to go through a lot of hurdles to be able to accept credit cards from Lebanon, but it was so worth it because I think that made a material difference. I think when you have a great cause and you can reach a global audience and people can relate to that cause, it always resonates. And I think art buyers want to buy great art, but are also philanthropic and want to support a great cause. So I think to your point, absolutely. I think sort of there is a huge appetite for good causes and art to support those causes globally. One more. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering um, what you think about this very um, growing interest in digital art. For example, behind you is a piece by a, a, a talented artist named Raphael Rosendahl. Um, and works like that are created uh, digitally. And all of your platforms provide outlets to sell that work digitally. Do you think that there is potential um, for digital art to, pr to be a, a disruptive force? I know that some of your sites have experimented with sales of digital work. I think that <clears throat> digital art, from my perspective, and I, I have been a collector of digital art and new media for a long time, um, I think it's uh, not that dissimilar to other categories of art which kind of start you know, early, like photography 30 years ago, for example, I think would be characterized in the same space. And I think that there is a market because digital art is made to be viewed in many instances online or on a screen. You know, there's more compatibility than there might be with viewing a painting, and that might spur adoption. But I still think you need, you know, intermediaries like there's great galleries in New York that specialize in digital arts. Steve Sachs at Bitforms is in the audience, and he does a great job showcasing artists who are working in that medium. And you know, I think that that's going to continue to gain in relevance as technology as part of our lives becomes translated into interesting works of art. Yeah, I think just to one small point, we've had a lot of success selling digital art. Actually, we did the Paddle Dawn auction in partnership with the Phillips Auction House, which raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for that cause, and the highest piece sold for almost $90,000. So there is a huge appetite, which I've been, frankly, been very surprised by. Okay, so I thank you all very, very much, and I hope I see you here again. Thank you. Thank you.